everybody to the ecology department uh, Thursday seminar. Uh, before I talk about today's speaker, I just want to let you know or possibly remind you that next week uh, Travis Malone will be here, research ecologist with the Wilderness Society. Uh, since Travis <laughs> took this job uh, in Montana, he's developed a really impressive and interesting research program and really strong interest in the department. Uh, collaborating on some research and serving on grad student committees and bringing speakers to the department for us. Uh, and so I'm hopeful uh, that you'll all be here next week to come visit when Travis comes. Uh, today, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce <coughs> Thor Burton, who's a, a senior uh, in wildlife here in the department. Uh, Thor transferred in from Northwest College a couple of years ago. Uh, and I remember the day he arrived, he uh, walked into the office, shook my hand, introduced himself, and sat down for a half hour talk about the future of his life in the Department of Ecology. Uh, and it was one of the better spontaneous conversations I've had uh, in some time. He says he started off as a paleontologist who was talked out of paleontology by other paleontologists which goes to show that we know more than you think. Ecology's maybe where it's at. Uh, I had the pleasure of having Tor only in one class, which is this one, uh, attending seminar and writing the weekly critiques. Uh, and the assignment is essentially based on the graduate record exam writing protocol. It's supposed to take maybe an hour of thoughtful time to write the essay. Uh, but Tor decided to write a term paper every week. Uh, and the longest, most insightful work uh, in the history of this class, uh, I'm quite sure. And probably most of you know that he sits in the front uh, most weeks. Tad usually gets in the first question, but Tor's always in there towards the front. Uh, and what I've observed from watching over the last two years is that I think the sharpest observer I've ever seen. At the end of the talk, he'll stick up his hand and say, now in that figure there, I saw that there was a place in the graph where the line went like this, and the speaker would flash back to the talk and look at it and go, no, you're right. I never <laughs> saw that before. And he does it every week. It's really amazing. I mean, it's visual acuity uh, and ability to focus on that sort of thing. Uh, so he's here today to talk to us about uh, some of his personal interests. Uh, he's in particularly interested in cat research and conservation with a special focus on human behavior, population ecology, and community ecology. Uh, and his seminar is entitled Red in Tooth and Claw, the ecology of within carnivora interspecific killing on and by the felidae.
I want to tell you a story. And it's a story that in some ways is over 25 million years in the making, with the first appearance of cats in the fossil record. And it's a violent story. It's a story that in some ways inspired Lord Alfred Tennyson, who famously described nature as being red in two and claw. And it's a story that has fascinated both researchers and non-researchers alike for many years. And this is the story of interspecific killing between carnivores and animals. Now, today I'm going to talk to you about some of my own research into the broad scale ecological patterns governing these killing relationships between cats and other carnivores. But before I do, I think it's important that I give you some of the necessary background and the consequences of, and some of the hypothesized drivers of these killing relationships between carnivore species. And one of the most significant of these the effects of interspecific killing can be found in the wholesale reduction of the population sizes of a given carnivore species. And I think one of the most famous examples of this occurred as a consequence of the interplay between lions and cheetahs. And lions have been known to be serving as a fairly substantial source of cheetah mortality, even going so far as to find cheetah cubs, digging them out of their dens and killing them. And as a consequence of this heavy mortality that lions put upon cheetahs, researchers have documented an inverse relationship between the abundance of lions and the abundance of cheetahs. Areas that have high lion density tend to have low cheetah density and vice versa as a consequence of these killing relationships. And this relationship is shown in this graph here, corrected for prey biomass. However, not all of these effects are as apparent and visceral as the actual killing act itself, but the threat of killing can cause behavioral changes in prey species as a response to the threat of killing. Uh, for example, interspecific killing may cause changes in the habitat use of a given carnivore species. And this was examined by Paul Marys et al. in 1996, who looked at the habitat use of Egyptian mongooses in Spain as a response to the habitat use of Iberian lynx. And what they found is that in areas of the landscape where there are many lynx, there tended to be very, very few Egyptian mongooses. And they hypothesized that one of the main reasons for this was that Iberian lynx often prey upon the Egyptian mongoose, and so they changed habitat types to avoid the threat of predation by lynx. Now, these relationships aren't necessarily as clear and concise as those I've described, and whether or not a carnivore changes behavior is often related to a wide suite of both abiotic and biotic patterns. And I think one of the best examples of this can be found in the relationships between tigers and leopards. In some areas, for example in Chitwan National Park in Nepal, tigers and leopards have almost complete range overlap, and there's very little to no evidence of spatial or temporal avoidance. On the other hand, in areas, uh, for example, in Kankan National Park in India, you see almost complete exclusion of leopards by tigers within the national parks. And leopards tend to be located at the periphery of national parks and edges of tiger ranges. And it's thought that the differences in whether or not you see exclusion due to between carnivore killing relationships can be mediated by things like the available prey base and the amount of habitat heterogeneity. High prey base tends to cause less conflict between carnivore species, and a high amount of habitat heterogeneity can allow avoidance at fine scale as opposed to the broad scale exclusion that occurs when habitat is very homogenous in an area with low prey densities like we see in India. But this still doesn't answer the question, why did these killing relationships occur in the first place? And to answer this question, researchers hypothesized three primary, not necessarily mutually exclusive drivers. On the one hand, you can kill a carnivore because it's a competitor and it feeds on the same resources as you do. If you kill a carnivore, you're reducing the extent of the exploitation competition because frankly, <coughs> dead animals don't eat that much. On the other hand, you can also 
also kill a carnivore as a sort of ecological kill or be killed response. You're killing another carnivore, and as a consequence of killing that other carnivore, you, redis you reduce the risk of yourself being killed or your offspring being killed by that carnivore species. And consequently, you should see uh, some kind of selection for these kinds of killing behaviors to reduce these risks. And finally, you can kill a carnivore for reasons that extend beyond just competition, in that you may be just predating, predating upon an animal, and that animal happens to be a carnivore. And so you kill it for reasons that extend beyond just competition, as shown with this mountain lion killing a raccoon and a leopard killing a mongoose. Now, the first systematic attempt to review the literature on between carnivore killing relationships was done by Paul Marys and Caro in 1999. And they searched through the literature to find as many examples of interspecific killing as they could, though they did not incorporate dietary data, those examples of killing relationships that are found through scats and stomachs, and they didn't include data where a domestic species was a killer species. And within their review, they found evidence for 97 different pairwise species interactions. Now, because I'm going to be using the term pairwise species interaction quite a bit throughout the course of this talk, I think it's important that I give you an idea of just what I'm referring to. Now, suppose for a moment that you're going to go through the literature and find examples of mountain lions killing other carnivores. And throughout the course of this literature search, you found references of mountain lions killing striped skunks, of mountain lions killing bobcats, of mountain lions killing gray wolves. These three uh, interactions comprise three distinct pairwise species interactions. And they're pairwise because they imply a sense of directionality. A mountain lion is killing a skunk, is killing a bobcat, is killing, killing a wolf. And so, in the case where a mountain lion kills a wolf, and a wolf kills a mountain lion, these are two different pairwise species interactions between because the killer species is unique and the killed species is unique. Now, the two primary uh, pieces of information that Polo Mary and Caro in 1999 put together is that, first of all, body size seems to structure these killing relationships and that carnivores that are larger than another carnivore can more easily kill that carnivore and if you're more similar in body size, or if you're smaller than another carnivore, you're less likely to kill it, because it's harder for you to do so. You pack less punch. Uh, conversely, they found that if you're a social species, you can offset these body size constraints by acting in a group. And so if there's 10 of you, and even if the animal you're attacking outweighs you, the group together is capable of 